How's it going everybody? So we're going to start our presentation today with a quick video. Pay attention to what happens in the video because it's going to be important later on. We're here at the Gordon Dam and what we're going to do is demonstrate uh, from the very top the effect of spin on a ball. So we're going to get a basketball and drop it uh, from 140 minutes up. Uh, one without spin and one with spin, and see what happens. Yeah. Yes, it's crazy. We're just just dropping it with no spin or anything like that. And as you can see, you know, that the ball was sort of doing its sway thing. So it wasn't going directly straight. It was pretty hard to predict where it's fine. So that's really cool. Ready? Whoa, look at that go! <laughs> This is Brett even through it. I literally just dropped it with a bit of spin, like I didn't even throw it, and it just took off. Like we had no idea that was going to do that. But yeah, see how it works. So that was a pretty amazing experiment with some really interesting results. Um, so the the first one that we had no spin on, um, it dropped straight down uh, with some lateral move, quite a lot of lateral movement, as you would have seen. Uh, but it didn't actually go forward at all, so it was almost, you know, fell directly below where it was dropped, which is what you would expect. Uh, but the one where we added the back spin, uh, it went perfectly straight, but it really took off as it gained speed, and it went, you know, close to 70 meters, I'd say, from, from the point at which we threw it, so 70 meters horizontally. So that was incredible. So what did you guys notice about the video? When the ball was dropped with no spin, it fell straight down. But when it was dropped with spin, it didn't fall straight down. It flew horizontally, fighting gravity. Why do you guys think that is? Well, it's due to something called the Magnus Effect, and it's the topic of our presentation today. I'm Jocelyn Dostal, a chemical engineering major at UNL. And I'm Taylor Seeley, a civil engineering major at UNL. So our presentation today is going to be divided into three main parts. The first part is going to be, what is the Magnus Effect and how does it work? The second part is going to be everyday ways you may have already experienced the Magnus Effect. And finally, we're going to talk about some engineering applications of the Magnus Effect. So the Magnus Effect was first experimented and discovered and also named after a German physicist and chemist named Heinrich Gustav Magnus. So Magnus was, a or it was more of an experimental physicist than a theoretical physicist, which meant that instead of worrying about equations and formulas and math, he was worried about actually doing physical experiments and seeing how things worked and just making physical observations. So his experiments with the Magnus Effect mostly involved round spherical projectiles and airflow and how those two things kind of go together and how you can use those things to make engineering solutions. So a fun fact about the Magnus Effect is also that it was first initially uh, experimented with by Isaac Newton but I guess scientists decided that he has enough things named after him already, so they decided to name it after the Magnus. So the key components to the Magnus effect are, first, a round projectile, as you can see here, like a soccer ball or the basketball in the video. The second one is airflow over the round object, and the third most important part is the rotation of the projectile itself. So you can see by this animation here, the ball is rotating backwards, which causes the airflow over the top of the ball to go faster, because it goes with the rotation. Whereas the airflow on the bottom of the ball goes against the rotation of the ball, which causes the ball to push into the air, which Newton's second law, every force, every action has a every action has a equal and opposite reaction. So when the ball rotates into the air, the air also pushes it back, which is going to create a perpendicular Magnus force here, which is what's going to give the ball a curved path, like we saw with basketball in the video. So if you wanted to model the magnitude of the Magnus force, we could use this simple equation. And it has a couple of variables, but they're all directly related to the force. And I'll talk about it now. So the first one is this weird looking P character. That's called rho. It's a Greek letter, and it's used in engineering to signify the density of either air or fluid or whatever object we're talking about. So in this case, the density is the density of the air. 
The next one is velocity. Velocity is basically, you can think of it as how fast the ball is flying through the air, but it also has to do with how fast the air is flowing over the ball itself. The next term is the radius r, which the radius, as most of you probably know, is the distance from the center of the sphere to the outside of the sphere. So basically the size of the ball is important as well. Finally, we have omega, which is another kind of weird looking Greek symbol. And omega represents angular velocity, which you can think of as just the speed at which the ball is rotating itself. So if we wanted to increase the Magnus of force, as I said, all of these variables are directly related to the force itself. So if we wanted to increase the Magnus force, an easy way would be to increase the speed at which the ball is rotating, so increasing omega. Another way we could do it, for example, would be to increase the speed at which it's flying through the air or the velocity. All of this is going to result in a larger Magnus force in the perpendicular direction. So you all may have seen the Magnus effect in sports such as baseball. As you all know, a baseball player knows how to throw a curveball in order to make the batter strike out. Similarly, a ping pong player knows how to put curve on the ball in order to make his shot more difficult for his opponent to return. And also, in soccer, a soccer player knows how to put spin on the ball in order to bend it around a wall of players and score a goal. So a more specific example of this is techniques a tennis player uses to use the Magnus effect to their advantage. So I was a tennis player in high school and I learned that you can hit three different types of shots. The first is a flat spin shot, the second is a top spin shot, and then the third is an underspin shot. So with a flat spin shot, the racket hit, strikes the ball at a, at a straight angle to make the ball go straight forward. And for a top spin shot, the racket hits the ball at an angle going over the ball, giving the ball a forward rotation and causing it to fight gravity and stay airborne for longer. And then in a back spin shot or an underspin shot, the racket hits the ball at an angle going under the ball, giving it a back spin and causing it to drop down to the ground quicker. So clearly a tennis player understands the Magnus effect and knows how to use it to their advantage. So staying on the topic of recreation, a paintball gun also uses the Magnus effect. And, and the way it works is the, the gun puts a backspin on the paintball and causes it to fight gravity and stay airborne for longer, similar to the backspin shot in tennis. So this makes the gun more efficient while using the same amount of energy. So the, the Magnus effect is not only used in recreation, but also in more technological engineering applications. How do you guys think engineers have used the Magnus effect? Well, one of the earliest attempts to use the Magnus effect by an engineer was by a U.S. congressman and engineer named Butler Ames in 1910. And he tried to make an airplane that used the Magnus effect to fly. The way it worked was these cylinders rotated backwards and gave the fighting gravity and gave, gave the plane a, a lift force. And then the propeller in the front gave the plane a forward velocity. So the problem with this design was that those rotating cylinders not only gave the airplane a lift force, but also caused more air drag. So when the plane went to slow down, it went straight down rather than get gradually coming down. So this plane was flown once and crashed, but that's okay because failure is a part of engineering. And if you build one prototype and it doesn't work, you go back to the drawing board and you try again. So a more successful story of an engineer using the Magnus effect is in rotor ships which are these giant ships that use these mass-like rotating cylinders for propulsion. The way they work is the Magnus force is always, which is represented in this picture by the green arrow, is always perpendicular to the direction of the airflow, which is represented by the blue arrow. So by controlling the speed and direction of the rotating cylinders, the boat can be propelled. And rotor ships are beneficial because they use um, electrical motors rather than gas engines to be propelled and can easily flow into the wind. So now that you guys have seen some ways engineers have used the Magnus effect, it's clear that engineers have not harnessed its true potential. How do you guys think engineers could more efficiently use the Magnus effect? Well, if you don't have any ideas now, hopefully one day you'll all become engineers and work on these ideas yourself. So now we're going to talk about what type of engineers could use the Magnus effect in the future. So we pinpointed two main types of engineers who would probably use the Magnus Effect. The first one is going to be aerospace engineers. So aerospace engineers use their knowledge of airflow and aerodynamics and use them to turn them into mechanical properties and they could use the Magnus Effect to make a more efficient airplane like the one we saw Butler Ames that Jocelyn explained. That one wasn't the best example, so aerospace engineers could in the future use the Magnus Effect more efficiently. Another type of engineer would be a mechanical engineer 
And mechanical engineers use mechanical, their knowledge of mechanical processes to make engines and cars and ships and planes more efficient. So a way that a mechanical engineer could use the Magnus effect would be by making more efficient engines using the rotor ships, for example. They could take those big mass-like cylinders, which would probably be designed by an aer aerospace engineer, and they can use, the mechanical engineer would probably design an engine that would make these mass more efficient. So does anyone have any questions about the presentation so far? Well, if not, we have some frequently asked questions that we can run through. So the first one is going to be, is the Magnus effect applicable only in air? Can it be applied in other liquids or fluids as well? And the answer to that question is, in engineering, we actually consider air a liquid or a fluid, as well as water, oil, other types of liquids as well. So the answer to that question is, yes, the Magnus effect can technically work in any environment, any sort of um, liquid. The thing is that with water, usually you'll have some buoyancy involved too, which can also make this effect kind of not work as well. The second question is, is the Magnus effect only caused by top spin or back spin or can it be applied in any rotational direction? I'll let Jocelyn answer that question. So the Magnus effect is not only created by top spin or back spin, but can also be created by side spin, causing the object to move sideways, such as the soccer example. And the last question is, how do engineers make equipment for athletes, and how do they use the Magnus effect to make them more effective? So knowing that the speed of rotation and the amount of rotation of a round projectile makes the Magnus effect greater, engineers use this concept to, with designing things like soccer cleats, golf clubs, ping pong battles. If you think about, you know, who's played ping pong before, right? About just about everybody. Ping pong paddles usually have a little rubber grip on the inside of the paddle. And what that does is it gives you more grip so when you hit the ball in certain directions, if you can get more spin on it, thus having a bigger Magnus effect, making it harder to return. So now we'll talk about the engineering design process and you guys are gonna to get to implement this today in our activity. So the first step of the engineering design process is to ask questions. The idea of engineers is we want to find problems in the world and try and solve them. So we have to come up with answers. We have to come up with ways that we can fix these problems. So which brings us into our next step is to imagine. So once we find a problem, we have to imagine ways to fix these problems. And this part of the step, we want to encourage you guys to think of any crazy ideas you can think of. They can be as outlandish or as unrealistic as you want. That's the whole point of this stage is just to brainstorm. So the next phase is to plan. And to plan, we want to pick two or three really good ideas and try and actually implement them. Maybe the more realistic ideas, but uh, we want to pick something that we can actually physically create, which brings us to the next step, which is the create phase. So the create phase, we're going to make prototypes or ideas. We're going to try and figure out how we can take materials and make these ideas actually happen. And a big part of engineering is failure, as Jocelyn mentioned with Butler Ames, that example, his rotor plane. Um, so failure is a huge part of engineering, and if your prototypes don't work the first time, the next and most fine or the final and most important phase of the engineering design process is to improve. So if your designs fail, your prototypes fail, the best part, the best thing to do, and the most important part as an engineer is to go back to the drawing board and try and improve this so that they, you can find a successful solution in the end. So this brings us to our activity, which is going to be using two plastic cups, some tape, and rubber bands, and what you're going to try and do is you're going to try to use these materials to make a Magnus Effect glider that can fly up to 10 feet in the air horizontally. So think about how in the video the backspin of the ball allowed it to fight gravity and fly horizontally through the air. Well you can use the same principle to design a Magnus Effect glider and that's what we want you guys to do today. And that's all we have for you guys so thank you. Thank you.